Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Health Talks, the speaker series of Arizona State University's College Health Solutions that aims to inspire collaboration and conversation on important topics in health. We're glad that you have joined us today for what will be a lively conversation among women in leadership about women in leadership. Today's discussion will be moderated by Dr. Deborah Hellitzer, who is in her third year as the Dean of ASU's College of Health Solutions. Since her appointment in August 2017, Dean Hellitzer led the College of Health Solutions through a collaborative visioning process to reimagine the identity of the college and expand its educational and research capacity. Prior to ASU, Dr. Hellitzer was the founding dean of the College of Population Health at the University of New Mexico, where she led the development of the nation's first undergraduate degree in population health. Since 2009, Dr. Hellitzer has focused her attention on mentoring and mentoring and career development among women faculty in academic medical centers. I can say much more, but let's hear from her directly. Please welcome Dean Deborah Hellitzer. Thank you, Marcus, for your kind introduction. I'm so pleased to be part of this discussion today with three very accomplished women colleagues from ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Kristen Gilder and Julia Wallace are co-authors of the recent book, There's No Crying in Newsrooms, What Have Women Learned About What It Takes to Lead? In researching the book, they interviewed more than 100 people, mostly women, Mia Parrish is one of the very accomplished women in journalism who they interviewed. Now, a little more about each of them. Kristen Gilger is a senior associate dean and Reynolds professor in business journalism at the Cronkite School and leads the National Center on Disability and Journalism. Particu previously, she ran ASU Student Media and under her leadership, ASU Student Media won many top national awards. Before coming to the Cronkite School, Ms. Gilder was De Deputy Managing News Editor at the Arizona Republic, where she led a team of more than 100 reporters and editors. She began her career as a reporter in Minnesota and South Carolina and moved up to editor roles in Salem, Oregon, and New Orleans. Welcome, Ms. Gilder. Julia Wallace is the Frank Russell Chair in the Business of Journalism and leads several innovative efforts at Cronkite. She teaches entrepreneurship, ethics, and gender in the media workplace and heads up a training program for the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, the Mayo Cr Clinic Cronkite Medical Journalism Fellowship and oversees the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Desk at Cronkite News. Before Joining the Cronkite School, Ms. Wallace was a top media executive and high-ranking editor at newspapers in major markets, including Atlanta, Phoenix, and Chicago. Finally, but not last, but not least, Mia Parrish is the Sue Clark Johnson Professor in Media Innovation and Leadership at the Cronkite School and CEO and President of MAP Strategic Groups based in Phoenix. Previously, Ms. Parrish was president and publisher of the USA Today Network, Arizona, and the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. Prior to coming to Arizona, she was president and publisher of the Kansas City Star and kansascity.com and ran Idaho's largest media company. She was the first Korean American publisher in mainstream media and the first minority to lead the Arizona Republic. Prior to these roles, Ms. Parrish was a journalist in major media markets, including Chicago, San Francisco, Phoenix, and Minneapolis. Welcome, ladies. To each of you, I say, wow, your accomplishments are so impressive, and we are all so glad that you could join us today. So let's get started. Kristen and Julia, I really enjoyed your book. I found it very interesting to compare my own research on the experience of women in academia with that of women in journalism. In academia, for example, 31% of full-time faculty in the US are women, 20%, 27% of tenured faculty are women, but even fewer are full professors. While 30% of college presidents are women, higher proportion of women presidents are found in two-year baccalaureate institutions while women represent only 22% of presidents in doctoral granting institutions. 
from my perspective, it doesn't seem to be getting better. Actually, I believe the efforts to put women in leadership positions are backsliding. What about in journalism overall? Are women really getting ahead into leadership roles? Or is it just the very few who get held up as examples of success? Julia, I can take it. It's up to you. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Kristen, you're up. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, it, this is one of the reasons we wanted to write the book in the first place was because we, I agree with you, we saw that women were sort of, we certainly weren't at the place we thought we would be at this point when Julie and I were starting our careers. Um, but also uh, we saw the backsliding as well. Um, when we looked at the numbers of women who are in top uh, news positions at organ news organizations. Um, it hit its peak like around, you know, 2008 or so, and has been sort of sliding ever since then. And I think that um, the reasons for that are, you know, many. One of them has to do with the um, economics of what has been happening in journalism. And um, I think, and I, I, I'm sure Julia agrees that uh, in part, you know, the attention has just been diverted to other areas. It's like, you know, we're in survival mode here. So uh, there has been less attention being paid, uh, I think, to diversity of all kinds. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that I think we really blew it in the after the 2008 recession um, because we really saw some black backsliding then. People basically said, you know, we're too busy to worry about diversity. Let's just, you know, whether it's gender, race, whatever it was, wasn't just about women. And, you know, we've got to just sort of do what we need to do. Well, the reality is that we know that unless you have a diverse work organization, you're not going to get the results you want. And so it sort of backfired on people. And so the question is, you know, now that we're in an economic crisis that in many ways is, will be significantly worse than what we experienced in 08, have we learned our lesson? And hopefully, can we turn things around this time, unlike we did, unlike last time? Right. And whenever you see a crisis, you know, so we struggled with that as well. You kind of snap toward what you know, and you know the familiar for a lot of people in newsrooms were people who looked like them. You know, so it's a lot harder when you're in the middle of a crisis. It's not an excuse. It's just sort of how it happens. So it. it only in places like what I was running or Julia was running or Kristen was running where you're really still deliberate about that and where you also understand that there's a business imperative. You know, the, the businesses that are more successful are more diverse, the teams that are more diverse are more successful. Um, and so I think it wasn't even just bad numbers. You know, you're gonna have worse outcomes because we took our eye off the ball right when we really, really needed to have our eye on the ball as an industry. And all of that is true outside of journalism, right? And in any industry or position uh, uh, traditionally dominated by men. We were talking just before the session started about the stories that are coming out about how countries headed by women are doing better during the coronavirus. So um, I, I, it applies to all kinds, uh, including, high, including higher education. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I was doing my interviews, uh, some women said, well, leadership is uh, a tall, white, a six foot man with a beautiful smile and women can't, you know, fit that. So, and then also I think that women are not thought of as finance geniuses. And so whenever there's a financial crisis, they turn to a man. And so I, I think that might be another thing. So the title of your book is There's No Crying in Newsrooms. Why did you make that the title of your book? Uh, well, I'll jump in here. Um, we think that uh, coming up with the title was like the hardest thing we did. We had like the entire book done uh, and we had been through a zillion bad titles. Uh, Mia had brought together some women to sort of brainstorm it. We still didn't have anything. And um, uh, what happened was uh, my daughter was in town and we went to the hairdresser. And I don't know about you, but that's where I get my best ideas. So uh, we were brainstorming ideas at the hairdresser and on the way home, it just hit me. It was one of my favorite movies of all time is Leah Their Own. 
Uh, and I'm sure many, uh, many of the people listening ha have seen that movie, Tom Hanks. It's about, um, you know, all the men go off to war during World War II and people want baseball, so they start a women's baseball team. And Tom Hanks is the sort of drunk, ne'er-do-well um, uh, uh, coach of the team. And there's this iconic scene where one of the women players starts crying because he's yelling at her for something she did on the field. And he says to her, there is no crying. There's no crying in baseball. And it occurred to me, I have told that to too many women. I've told that to my daughters. That there's no crying in the newsroom. And afterward, we thought it was perfect because a number of the women we had interviewed had actually talked about this issue of crying or rather not feeling like they could cry in the newsroom. And they'd tell us, you know, they'd go to their car in the parking lot or the stairwell or most popular, the women's restroom to cry. Um, and, it's, and it's very emblematic, I think, of how the place women felt like they had or didn't have in, in, in the news organization. Julia, you want to say anything? Yeah, the only thing I would add is I think, you know, one of the um, interesting stories that we tell in the book is about Aggie Underwood, who was a city, one of the first women city editors in the country back in the 40s. And it, there's this fabulous photo of her where she's got a baseball bat on her desk and she actually had a gun loaded with blanks in her desk drawer. And that was because, and she was quoted in a Time Magazine article talking about, I needed it to get the respect of the men. And so the, the reality is, you know, back then, even until, you know, in, even to some degree to now, it's like you've got to play the part. You, you have to be tough, you have to be male. And so crying is not a, it, what those tall white guys do with the perfect teeth, right? And so therefore it's something that, that has been heavily discouraged. Although almost every other kind of emotion is tolerated, just not that one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Although in the end of the book, there is a young woman who says, I'm crying. It's okay. I, you know, so you think that's a uh, changing in, in with. Among so, people? yeah. So that's, um, that was actually one of, I, one of my favorite interviews was Melissa Bell, who's the um, uh, head of Vox, V-O-X. I don't know if anybody's spending time on Vox Media, but they own Vox and SB Nation, Eater, a bunch of media brands. And she got into this idea of Vox because she wanted to change journalism um, with uh, another guy, Ezra Klein. And instead, I think she's actually changed journalism culture. So she's a big crier. Um, she cried three times during the times I interviewed her. Um, and she cries in the newsroom and has sort of set- She cries at board meetings. Yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, yeah. So, she's, she's an emotional person. <laughs> she's very, I mean, it's just sort of, Mm -hmm. And and I talked to one reporter who said that it, it was very empowering the first time she saw her cry because it was like, oh, this is a safe space. And so, you know, there's a lot of studies that have been done on the effectiveness of teams as most determined by psychological safety. And so I think she in many ways has sort of helped create that. And, and so it, part of what we talk about in the book is, you know, part of what we've got to do as women is not just sort of come in and put on the men's suit, but also mm -hmm. change some of these norms. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I uh, recently, during this whole crisis, talking to my faculty and staff, I've gotten very choked up because I'm so impressed with them. And, and, you know, and I don't want not to, I don't want to have to not show my emotions. I think that's my authentic self, but I, um, I do think about it. You know, so. And that's really, I think, increasingly important to younger generations. If you talk to millennials or Gen Zs, they talk a lot about authenticity and not wanting to hide who they are in the workplace. And so, I mean, I actually feel fairly encouraged that some of those norms will shift. Well, or maybe men will cry too, right? So. That, that would be powerful. Right. Well, and that there is there is power and vulnerability too when you admit like I don't know or this is difficult or you know we're trying to work through this and I think you know women tend to be better at that culture change and Melissa certainly found that and then there's research to back that up as well that 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 kind of um, that kind of culture in a time of challenge has more impact and better outcomes um, for you know, the people on that team or in that organization. 
Although it's also true that, um, that if a man cries, that that is received differently. True. And so there's still a lot of work to do. It's not just, oh, I feel like I can cry. It is if a man cries in a work organization, they're seen as empathetic. You know, like that, it's sort of like, oh, he's uh, taking care of his children. Isn't he wonderful, right? Um, and if a woman uh, cries, that is seen as, it's not seen the same way. It is seen as much more of a weakness. So I think there are larger cultural issues at, at play here. Yeah, well, I agree with you. So why do you think that women are not seen as having leadership qualities? Do you think that leadership style has anything to do with it? I and mean, we're just sort of talking about crying. When women take on authoritative approaches, why are they criticized for that type of leadership style? You know, she's aggressive. She's, um, but when they take a more collaborative approach, then, then that's not seen as leaderly. Why do you think that is? Well, we talk a lot in the book about this issue of leadership styles. And um, as you mentioned, we interviewed almost 100 women, all, all of whom are accomplished, right? They had risen to the top levels of, of news organizations. And um, they all talk about this. And, um, and they really do see themselves as being constrained to a narrower range of styles um, than, than men are. And it's not that there's one style that fits all women, or is right for all women, or one style that is right for all men, it's that men can operate within a much larger range. So they could be more nurturing and that might work for them, you know, depending upon them and their, their workplace. They might be, you know, really sort of hardcore and aggressive and that might work for them, you know, depending upon how they deliver that in their workplace. But women really can't uh, don't operate very successfully at either of those extremes. So they're sort of pushed to the middle in terms of their leadership styles. And, and that's limiting. Um, that's particularly true, we heard from women of color who feel like they really are constrained in the in push to that middle in their choices of leadership styles. So that doesn't really answer your question as to why that is. I mean, the why we could, you know, we could go way back. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're dealing with, with cultural norms um, that are uh, in some ways unique to this country, but in some ways not unique to this country. Julia, you want to jump in on that? Or yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add is I do think it's a lot of culture. You know, I do think there are variations by country, you know, just as countries vary. Um, but, you know, some, some of the issues go back a very, very long way. Um, I think that, um, you know, some of it is, is reinforced in all sorts of ways. You know, one of the questions in the chat is how do we combat some of these issues of these mm -hmm. cultural views? And I think some of it, frankly, starts with a lot of boring HR stuff. Um, is that, you know, what are your pay equity policies? You know, what are your hiring practices? What are your promotion practices? How are you ensuring it? that a lot of times we tend to sort of put all that HR stuff in the box and don't make it part of our living, breathing culture and that the head of the organization doesn't believe it and walk the walk and really make it happen. And, and that's what it takes. I mean, Kristen and I worked for a media company where the CEO was a very early supporter of diversity and made a difference because he was, you know, everything from bonuses to, you know, whether you got, you know, whether you got the next promotion depended on how you responded to this question. And so I think that's a pretty critical part, but it's like, it's not very sexy, frankly. And so I think that's one thing. I think the other big thing is I would put on that list is male allyship. That, you know, when Kristen and I have talked about it, we've said one of the regrets we have is that we didn't talk enough to men. You know, we spent a lot of time talking to ourselves about it and we all agreed, imagine that. Um, but if we're really gonna make change, the entire community has to change. And that means men as well as women need to sort of understand and want to have an equitable work environment. You know, when, uh, when Julie and I were coming up in newsrooms, um, I think Julia, you described this best. You, you said that we were fighting a ground war. Right. It was like things would happen to us and 
whether that was, you know, a, a, a sexually disparaging kind of comment or a promotion or, or pay or whatever. And we fought those battles ourselves. We fought them one by one, but by ourselves largely, although we talked to other women. And we really thought, I thought, you know, okay, you know, I'm, I can make these changes for me that will pave the way for other women behind me. I will help bring up those women behind me. They get to leadership positions, problem solved. And, and that didn't happen. Um, and, and it's for the reasons Joy I just described is because we were not looking at the larger institutional, organizational, or cultural issues. It's not just a ground war, right? It's, it's a, it, what do you call it? It's a, it's a battle for all, for all of us. Mm -hmm. And Lauren asked too, you know, how to, as leaders, do you cultivate that different environment? It's, it's an all the time thing is what I found too, you know, and it's HR and then living those policies. And then when you do the thing, you know, whatever, like um, when you're calling out women leaders or teams or, you know, that you're reinforcing why it is like why we have this diversity committee and here's what the output is of this and here's why we're better as an organization for this and you know like every you know we're serious about these things or we're going to you know talk about these things that are hard to talk about in a funny way but you know we have serious outcomes for it so like being really transparent and deliberate like all the time um, because it's also really easy to snap back because you know as soon as I was gone you know the team looked different as soon as Julia was gone from her organization the team was different so it's we're really, the three of us have been good at changing the environments where we had control over it, but that sustainability, I think is my big, you know, big um, uh, regret of mine, you know, figuring out how to keep that so it's sustainable, um, that that culture change, changes permanently. It's really, really hard. That part's hard. I also think, mm -hmm. sorry, ma'am. I also think it's really important that we use data and that we really look at data, there's a lot of implicit bias. I mean, promotion is an, an example of that where, you know, we go, well, I'm, I'm not being biased here, right? I mean, I, I looked at the applicants and this looks like the best applicant mm -hmm. or who gets the pay raise or uh, the job or the promotion. And we don't, and we, or even how the wording used in evaluations, right? How we're evaluating people. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, unless we use data to call out those issues, those patterns, then we're just simply not aware of it. And it's not all bad intention. Some of it is just, oh, no, definitely not. It, it is who we are. And without, you know, um, without, without data and the conversation, as, as Mia said, um, it, it, people aren't going to be convinced that anything needs to change. Mm -hmm. And the, and the business case for, it. I mean, that's what I did, you know, too, just saying sometimes that's the language that people listen to, not employee engagement or happy, you know, happiness or anything. It's like, okay, we, we're more successful and here are the reasons that, you know, we're going to be more successful with our audiences or our students, whatever. Somebody else asked if you had um, to give your past self some advice for um, when you were starting out in the professional workforce. And I think Julia loves giving advice. Hi, Julia. <laughs> she's better about this. Yes, she's better Julia, about like, thinking of this. <laughs> what would you tell your snotty 20 year old self? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's so, I mean, that's so much about sort of who you are, right? So usually the, the most important advice I like to give to women is the importance of confidence and perseverance and resilience. Cause I see too many women get sidelined by that. I didn't really have that issue. I mean, no. my advice was I needed to tone it down a little. So, you know. But, but the issue of confidence is a, is a really interesting one. And there's been a lot of research that shows that, you know, you can, uh, 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 that women just have a lot less confidence in many cases than men do. So, you know, the classic example of that is, you know, you show women a job description and um, a woman will apply for that job if they meet like maybe 60% of the qualifications. And oh, no, she needs like 80. <laughs> or, 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 I'm sorry, men will apply if they oh, meet 60% no, yeah. of the qualifications. <laughs> women, like, they feel like they have to have 100% of the qualifications to apply. And what was really surprising to me when we interviewed these women, and like I said, they were incredibly accomplished women. 
successful by any standard, and so many of them expressed a lack of confidence. Um, one woman said to me, uh, I'm still waiting for them to figure out I'm not as good as they think I am. And, and I was just completely taken aback by that because I'm like, you, you, you got to be kidding. Um, but there is that confidence gap. And so my advice to young women is that if you're going to be a leader, you have to be able to act. And you have to be able to act even when you don't have 100% of the information and even if you're not feeling 100% confident about the decision. Now, the percentage, how close you want to get to that is an individual circumstance, right? But you have to be able to say, okay, I feel confident enough to act or to make this decision. Um, and, and I think that's critical for women to be seen as leaders. Mm -hmm. I think there are a couple, um, I would, a couple things I tell our students, you know, I tell my past software students that do raise your hand more, you know, when there are opportunities, like just try them out and you're going to fail more times than you're going to succeed. But um, the, you, you know, this is teachers as well as professors that the male students tend to raise their hands more literally figuratively than the female students, not so much at Cronkite because we've, we've got um, some really uh, strong, well, we also have majority female population. Yeah, majority. But yeah it's majority and majority female um, faculty as well. So I think that there's a little bit of a different vibe, but to raise your hand and to accept opportunities, even when you think you're not ready for them. And Julia taught me that actually. So she, she uh, plucked me out for jobs in newsrooms many, many years ago. Um, so the second thing is when you have made it or when you do step, when you are able to um, bring others along with you to pay it forward. So that's, you know, advice I, I, did do, but advice I would give my younger self to make sure that you're, you're bringing others along with you. And sometimes to step into a position that you don't feel entirely. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, and I tell them that too, that every job I ever took for the first time, I'd never done before, right? Hello. What, what, how would I have experience in doing that the first time? So. Uh, yeah, I think women have this imposter syndrome, right? I don't know if I don't know already know the job, then I couldn't mm -hmm. possibly do it. Right. Um, I also, in, in academia, particularly in research, the data show that women don't actually, when they get a rejection on a grant proposal, they don't reapply. They don't use that oh. information and reapply. They don't resubmit their papers. And I think that there's this, you know, so I think perseverance is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and having a sponsor or mentor or somebody who's going to say, no, 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 come on, just, you know, let's fix this. And, yeah, I think so, we do. We definitely have uh, Julie and Chris and I, who have known each other a long time, are very different. But what we have in common is definitely that resiliency, you know, not necessarily confidence that manifests itself in the same way, but, you know, dust ourselves off and get back up again and, you know, move forward. And that, and you need that um, right. sort of pig headedness. I don't know what that is. Right? <laughs> See for yourself, Mia. <laughs> <laughs> Resilience. So in higher education, we see a lot of these sort of what I would call middle level leadership roles have been formed like the, um, pink, I would call them the pink collar roles, the vice dean, the vice provost, the vice president. And I think these are still service roles. You know, the women in these roles are still doing the housekeeping. They're still doing most of the work. So the people at the top can take the credit. Um, Mia, is that still true? In ver is that also true in, ver in journalism? Uh, yeah, that's very, I think it's true in most, um, in most industries. Journalism, you certainly would see that. Uh, it was rare to be in a newsroom where you had all women leaders. You know, we've had that a couple of times. I've had that a few times. But almost only when I'm the woman in charge, right, then, that then there are other there are more women around me, um, but typically you're, you're not seeing, you, you're capping out. And a lot of those roles are in HR and, and um, that's, that's commonplace. It's so changing a little bit. Yeah, you've got, yes, tell your story. <laughs> no, there was an interesting study done about 20 years ago in the news media business, and it's been replicated in other industries, but I think it's so interesting that it found that women got to middle management without you know, sort of breaking a sweat because it's like, tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And so they were pleasers and it really appealed and they got all this stuff done. 
But then they never went beyond that because at some point you don't want somebody who says, tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. You need somebody who is going to take charge and have their own ideas. And what happened is these women became unbelievably frustrated because they're like, I did everything you wanted. I did, you know, I succeeded on exactly the terms you told me to succeed on. And now you're telling me I can't move up. And that's just so frustrating. And, and you, it totally resonates, right? You go, oh, I totally get that. And I think that that's, you know, that remains and where that is in any organization that can vary. But I think that is very much a recurring thing. And I see somebody else, Christine is asking, have any of us had ne negative experiences with other women in leadership positions? And if so, how did we handle them? And is there any- We love this share? question. We love Chris this question. I love this you know, question. The funny, <laughs> funny thing about this question is, is we never even thought about this when we were writing the book until we started going out on book tour and women would ask us this question. <laughs> oh, I can talk about this one. <laughs> Yeah, go so, ahead. You go right. All right. So we're going to, all right. So Chris and I have a different, so our view was, we mm -hmm. really were sort of thrown by the question because it never came up in our interviews. We never probed on it. it I mean, sort of our experience were, did we have, you know, did we meet women along the way who weren't great colleagues or weren't great bosses? Sure. But we met men along the way the same way. And I think we never really attributed it to gender. I mean, if anything, we sort of tend to give women a break saying, hey, sort of standards for what what women are held to are higher than for men and so i don't know i i think we um we didn't i mean i and i literally you know sort of went back and and i remember chris and i one night after one of these q a's had this conversation where we're literally sort of racking our brains for our career trying to think of a case where you'd say oh yeah that was a queen bee that was somebody who wanted to be at the top and didn't want any other women and we, in our, in our careers anyway, and we had, didn't have that experience, which is sort of, yeah. you know. I think, I think that some of it is um, back when, and this is going to be a different time frame for different industries, but for journalism, you know, back in the 50s and 60s and even 70s, um, when th there were only a, a very few seats at the table for women. And so when a woman got to that seat, I, I believe there was, you know, some queen bee behavior, like there's only room for me, right? I'm not going to let anybody else in. But I think that as women, at least in journalism, started entering the industry in large numbers, which took place starting in the late 1970s, mid to late 70s, um, that that behavior, I think, largely changed. And I think the other thing that's at play is what Julia referenced, which is, you know, a man cannot be supportive in a work environment, you know, can blow you off, say something rude, not support you in some way. And you just sort of like say, okay, you know, he's a jerk. If a woman does that, I think it's interpreted differently. Um, so I don't think it's the behavior that's different. I think it's the way we receive that behavior. We perceive the woman then as being a queen bee. Does that make sense? Yeah, see, I have a different experience. But yeah, oh, yeah. I yeah. yeah no. I mean, I think you. I I think there is an element of that. Like you expect the men to not be so supportive, and you're hoping that the women would be supportive. So there's definitely an element of that. Um, I'm Gen X, and my generation's smaller. And um, the women ahead of me now. This the two of you like hired me and promoted me and helped me and you know yeah, like that say anything bad about us me no no i know truly and like and but you're the exception in my experience right so most of the people who helped me other than the two of you were men and that you know that and there i have a lot of examples of women who were hostile unhelpful as well as women younger than i was um, who I was trying to help, who were who were jealous because they'd been treated the way that I'd been treated. So I, I worked harder to be, you know, to help and to be deliberate in talking about that as an issue, um, and to really to bring that up and to sort of call people on their crap when they were acting like a queen bee. Um, I called it empress behavior, but you know that that kind of. I don't know, Julia. We may have to do a different book on this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and I think when things got tough, too, when there were, you know, women didn't have as many seats at the table at one point, 
at some point there were fewer seats at the table period, right? As the industry got smaller. Yeah. So I think some of it may have had to do, do that. with that as well. That. It's sort of, you know, it just got more competitive period and that could be. Mm -hmm. more aggressive. Sorry. So <clears throat> among the stories of sexual harassment in the broadcasting, <laughs> Um, Mia, your story was particularly poignant to me. Um, we've all seen the challenges for women in speaking up due, due to fear of rep, retribution and retaliation. My mm -hmm. young daughter spoke to me about that very recently. Um, is there a reason that we should believe that it's going to get better or that, that we'll always have to face that in our work? Um, should Mia tell her story first? <laughs> so I, I think the one that the dean's referencing, I was, um, uh, I, I've had, I have a lot of stories, but um, a couple of years ago, I, I'd had an encounter with um, Representative Don Shooter at the legislature, and I kind of brushed it off. Um, it was, it was rude and it was un inappropriate, and. Uh, and it, it was bad enough that I mentioned it. And part of the reason it was bad was because I was in charge of the largest media organization in the state. And this was the head of the appropriations committee saying something that was grossly inappropriate and sexual to, to me in front of my attorney. Um, and time passes and one of his colleagues calls him on, um, you know, makes allegations against him. And then somebody else makes allegations against him. And so I ended up writing about that and, and, Anyone who knows me and Julian and uh, Kristen certainly know this. I am not a, I don't, I'm not flamboyant. I don't like to be the center of attention. I don't want coverage. I don't like to be on camera. Um, I didn't tend to write pieces, certainly not first person pieces um, particularly, but this time around I, I wrote about it and they, the day it published, they pulled him off his committees and he was, um, eventually voted out of the, he was the first legislator in, this, in the country voted out over Me Too. So that was kind of a big deal. And we've had since one of the, one of the people who- so Mia, the, so Mia, the question is, so is that, is that gonna keep happening? Are people, I mean, even despite Me Too, are people gonna continue yeah. to face this kind of harassment? Yeah, I think they are. And I, and I yeah. <laughs> oh, I, good. Yeah, sorry. Um, now I think, I think, it's going to lessen. I think there are better channels for reporting it. I think people are more aware, you know, it gets talked about. I think we're seeing some changes. Certainly I see it with the students. You know, we actually just had this whole conversation about a week ago. It came up, we were talking about leadership styles and, and getting ahead and getting jobs and what, you know, what sort of roles and whatever. And, um, and the students, at, the male students asked me, you know, what can we do to be better allies? What does that look like? You know, if we're in this kind of discussion and the woman gets talked over, you know, if somebody mansplains something to her, you know, what can I say? What can I do? How can I be a good team, teammate? And trust me, when I was in college, this was not something that my male colleagues were <laughs> saying, you know, like, how can I be helpful to you when somebody takes your idea, you know? And so you're seeing more of that. I think the awareness is raised, but my short answer of no is that, you know, this is three years ago and I'm, the president and CEO of the largest media company, and that's still happening, you know, and I, the sorts of things that still happen, even at the top levels, make me worry about what's going on for our students, for interns, for people coming into the, into job experiences, you know, now. Um, Julie and I did a panel on, with sports, uh, women in sports journalism, um, about a year and a half ago, and there were, I don't know, what do you think, Julie, three or 400 people at that and she asked how many of you have, you know, stand up if you have been harassed on the job. And every single person stood up and they were young. I mean, these were people starting, you know, not everybody, but you know, a lot of them starting out. So it's still very prevalent that, and that that's in the middle of me too. So that really concerns me. It takes a lot longer to change. I think one of the interesting things, uh, we also tried to interview a number of young women uh, for the book and, um, and what they describe um, largely is an environment where things are still happening, but they're more subtle than the things that happened to me and probably Julie as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we were being sexually harassed, you really knew you were being sexually harassed, right? Um, like being propositioned. I mean, it was very clear. 
Um, and what the young women describe to me now is uh, where they're, they're not so sure sometimes. It's like, they, it, it, go, it goes back to that issue of confidence and sort of doubting themselves. So something happens and they go, oh, you know, did, did that really just happen? Am I just being mm -hmm. overly sensitive? Am I crazy? And in some ways, I think that those micro get aggressions, as the as the um, as the viewer um, asked, can be even more difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly think we have challenges. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a couple questions on the Q and A. Um, maybe Julie and Crystal want to call those up too. The, when I'm in conflict, I tend to have an adrenaline rush and I can no longer think clearly. Do you still get nervous and comfortable with conflict? And where are some of the techniques that you help to manage your reactions? Um, I'll answer that because I actually hate conflict. I'm like, a, I love harmony. I don't like, you know, that's my least favorite space. Um, so I've really had to come up with um, ways to manage that and have those difficult conversation, you know, that kind of confrontational thing. Um, I tend to do a lot, of, this sounds sort of crazy, but like that meditative breathing, you know, just sort of center myself before I'm dealing with that adrenaline rush. But um, it, it has also taken practice over time where I'm like, okay, if I'm going to be in this kind of situation, or I'm going to have to have this kind of conversation. Um, you know, I've, I've had people who work for me, like really difficult conversations I've had to have around sex harassment and, and um, issues of uh, disrespect or whatever that, that, that is hard. So that's just like a real thing. And I feel for you, whoever asked that question. Um, somebody asked about, can we talk a little about clothes that women should wear to the office? And is there an expectation of work dress for women to be taken seriously? Julia and Kristen and I have different answers to this. What do you guys think? I think the answer is it depends. Depends on yeah. time. Yeah. You have to understand your workplace and the culture of that workplace to answer the question. To, and, and I'm, I, I actually, this is one of those ones I've sort of changed over time. I think the answer is yes. And I say that from someone who I think sometimes was, def I'm, I like dressing. Uh, I'm going to laugh I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, and not like, not in a provocative way. It's not no, that, no, 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 no. Yours is not just provocative. Like, yeah, it's not provocative. It's just sort of wild. You know, I like. Julie Bright doesn't like colors. to blend. She won't blend. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I like <laughs> hats, you know, I like patterned hose, you know, I'm like that, you know, I like crazy <laughs> shoes, but it's like, I, I would say, and this sort of goes to part of that sort of younger self advice. I think sometimes people made assumptions about me that were faulty because of that. And so I sort of think probably, you know, so I think you really need to think about the fact that whatever you wear does make people sort of decide what they think of you based on first impressions and right. be thoughtful about it. I mean, right. to Chris's point, it depends what your culture is, what you want to do, but mm -hmm. yeah, I don't wear the yellow pantsuit anymore. I, <laughs> let, I thought the yellow pantsuit was really quite some, and it was not Prada. It was, it was very high fashion. Now, um, I remember, Julia, you showing up in the newsroom in Salem, Oregon, straight from Chicago, and everybody went, whoa, what is she wearing? <laughs> And, and I had a very, I had, I was a very conservative, very purposefully, very conservative dresser. I wore close toe shoes. I always wore, um, you know, I never wore short sleeve dresses. I always wore jackets. Um, I was very, and that's probably because I was a very young manager to begin with, you know, so I just, uh, I didn't have the street cred. So I dressed not like a guy, but conservatively, um, and, and to Julia's point, I think part of that has to do with what you're willing to sacrifice for it. If it's super important to you to have your tattoos, you know, and that's who you are and you want to deal with the consequences of what that can do, that might mean you don't get some of the jobs that you want. People think certain way, a certain way about you. But I found that it was hard enough to do the job at the age that I was without having people say that, you know, I dressed a certain way or whatever, you know, I was provocative or something. I also didn't drink until I was like, 30 and I never drank on the job, you know, because that was another thing that just sort of image wise is harder for women. I mean, literally, I didn't drink on the job, but I also didn't drink at work events, I should say. Of course, I don't drink on the job. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, Kristen, you didn't drink on the job, did you? No. Yeah. I just mean like nobody who worked for me ever saw me drink. Yeah, there were no. <laughs> we got it. We got it. <laughs> Sorry. 
you know, I always said that wearing <laughs> clothes, you, you wanted people to get past that. You wanted to have them stop looking at your clothes and right. listen to what you're saying. Right. And you then, want the clothes to be like a good thing. Wow, she's so fashionable right. and smart. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> about that. Right. Exactly. So <clears throat> um, let's talk about the household responsibilities and the family caretaking. You know, it's, uh, women now are sort of like marshmallows between two um, hard pieces of bread. They're, you know, young children or even teenagers are sometimes more difficult than young children. And on the other hand, elder parents. Um, you know, how can women find quality of time for themselves uh, while working to, you know, lead and also having all those household responsibilities? What do you think about that? Um, Ariana Huffington is one of the women we interviewed for the book, is making a whole career out of this, trying to answer this question right now. She's doing a very popular blog on exactly this topic. Um, we do devote a chapter in the book to work-life balance, which most of the women would just scoff at that very term, like there is no such thing, right, as work-life balance. But I think the best advice came from um, uh, uh, Mindy Marquis, who's the publisher now of the Miami Herald, and this really helped me. She said, you know, we think of it as being 50-50, right? 50% job, 50% family. And she said, the truth is, is that it never, hardly ever is 50-50 at any one time. That, you know, sometimes it's 100% your job uh, because it needs to be. Uh, and sometimes it's 100% your family. And you just try to get that 50-50 balance maybe over a long period of time. Um, and that's a very helpful way, I think, of looking at it and maybe takes a little bit of the pressure off. I do want to acknowledge, too, I mean, Julie and Kristen and I had very high-level jobs, and we were able to move around the country. Um, I don't have children, but Julie and Kristen each have two daughters. All three, of us, all three of us have very, very supportive husbands who are very, like, so qualified and so smart and so confident in their own right. So they were cool with having strong-minded, career-oriented wives and not competitive. And, and that did help us too. And that is hard when you don't have that. My husband stayed home for 12 years and raised our three kids. Um, oh, two daughters not, and Patrick. I'm sorry. And there's a, there's a third one, right? That, that boy. Yeah. Um, uh, but That's you know, other. that, that also has pressures. I mean, I, I, I've yeah. told the story about one time when I was in New Orleans and um, I uh, came home from work early one day, like four or five o'clock. And my uh, oldest daughter was then like seven years old, was sitting on the living room floor playing with her best friend. And uh, she looks up at me and says, hi, mom. And her best, and I'll never forget this, her best friend looks at her and says, I didn't know you had a mom. <laughs> Which I was like, what? <laughs> But so, so there's always know, a certain amount Gary's, of guilt. Gary's very nurturing. Yeah, the one thing out, I right. would add to add to this is the importance of focus. I mean, I think that many times that women are so much more effective in the workplace is because we really figure out how to focus. Um, there's something called the Pomodoro method, which is all about how do you like sort of focus on work in sort of intense spurts almost. And I think that's part of what you got to do. You got to figure out how when you're, you know, doing a project for work, you are 100% in. And then when you're with the kids or you're with your parents, you're 100% in. Because trying to do it 50-50 is a, you know, road for just feeling like you're fraying at every, every, every. Sometimes way. you're, you know, the work needs 90%. You know, I mean, there, there, are, there are just are those times. So I've, like, overarching 50 50 but sometimes it's right. like weird over here and i'm like just a crappy wife and daughter and sometimes i'm a really great daughter because they need me and i'm not you know and and i've got to say hey i'm I, I need to go take care of this thing for my family so that's part of it too we have an interesting question related to this from lauren about disparaging comments that she gets mm -hmm. about the hours that she's working I don't know, my first reaction is to, to this is like, don't listen to those people, but you all might have better response than that. I did laugh. Um, Julia, one of Julia's daughters are living with her during COVID and one of them, and they're both very driven, <laughs> shocking, 
but one of them was talking about she was utilizing this time to show why she should be able to work it from home sometimes. And so she was like getting ahead on all of this stuff to show how, you know, very efficient she was. And I think um, some of that is, some of it is saying like, hey, we're able to multitask. This is how I'm able to do all of these things. Um, you know, we. I've responded to that as a boss, certainly, you know, and been flexible. And when you sort of have the data to show what that looks like, um, that can help break us out of boxes too. And I, and I don't know if this helps, but, you know, raising children is a long range proposition. And I would argue that what you're doing with your work is uh, something that is a, is a really important lesson for your children that will show up later in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. My kids used to say, you love me, you love your work more than me. But now they, you know, they say, oh, I understand now why you did that. So oh, there's wow. a, yeah, <laughs> there's a great question here in the, um, in the questions. There are many situations in which men aren't thrilled to have a woman on the team or the project. However, there are instances where men have actually considered, oh, are there instances where men have actually considered having a woman on the team as a benefit or an advantage. Yeah, so uh, let me, uh, here's what's interesting is, is um, in the past two years or so, there have been an increasing number of women on corporate boards. And the reason that's happened is because of data that has come out showing that companies have better financial results when they have diversity on boards, right? And so I think, you know, there actually are people who get it. I mean, we, you know, all of us have examples of people who, I mean, the people who mattered, who really allowed me to do what I wanted to do in my career were men, frankly, because there weren't that many women doing it. Um, and so absolutely, I think that that's, I think that's real. And, and to find those allies, you know, to really look for those people who are supportive, um, because they're, I think many times they are looking for people to help. Mm -hmm. um. A couple of people are asking about, you know, like microaggressions and those sorts of things too. And I think those are related when you're like calling people out that you know, there are different tactics and different ways that you do that. I, I use humor a lot because I get uncomfortable with like the aggressive way of doing that. But um, I think that's, there are different, different people have different styles in doing that. It's a difference. Yeah, me, I don't mind confrontation at all. So. Yeah, Julian and... You no, know, it's true. Like, Chris and Julie are very much more like calling people in a problem. And I'm like, did you really, really mean to just say that thing that was totally inappropriate and could get you sent to HR? Really? You sure? Do you want to try again? Let's try that again. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. I do, I do think there's, <laughs> there's an important question about women of color. And, and I mentioned yes. that I think women of color face even more um, obstacles and challenges than other women do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I just want to throw that out there. Mia, you might want to want to mm -hmm. jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, every so often I want to take out of my bio that I was the first Korean American this or the first minority that um, because, you know, I hate, it, it's kind of sucks to be the other, but, but it also, I have a, a sense of pride about being, you know, a role model for people, especially, you know, the older that I get. Um, but there is an added both obligation and pressure. And there are definitely stereotypes that come with um, being a woman of color, depend, you know, depending on what it is. So like, I've been called a dragon lady, which I find particularly, you know, fraught as an Asian American. Um, and there, there will be those those things happen and they make it harder to do the job. And they're also that unconscious bias, you know, where people just bring on their own um, assumptions or biases or, you know, they're not, they're not mean spirited necessarily, but they're like, oh, well, you must need to stay at home because blah, blah, or you, you know, you're so, I'm pretty quiet ordinarily. And people think that that's like mysterious Asian. It's, it, it, they don't mean to be that way. So dealing with that, I do think there's an added level of challenge. Um, and there's, and part of that comes from having to be in a culture where you're surrounded by more people who look like you or understand the circumstances and, and can be more open about that. But it continues, it's still, it's still a problem. 
I well, think the numbers person. really back it up. As bad as it is for white women uh, mm -hmm. in positions of power, for mm -hmm. people, for women of color, the numbers, you know, whether it's in media or any in any, industry. any organization, the numbers are mm -hmm. awful. And the same with pay equity, you know, that the people who make less uh, money than anyone are Latina uh, women. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are there are significant challenges. There's no I, th I think one of the one of the things that can be helpful in a workplace is for women of color in particular is to find their team. You know, it's to find it's to find the allies and the other people who you can educate. Maybe they don't come to you educated, mm -hmm. but you could, you need those allies and the people who understand in the workplace. Um, and I think that can make it not easy, but perhaps easier. It also has been. Um, it was helpful to find allies within. So not just like Asian women and find other Asian women. It's like you know other people within a diverse. You know, build a diversity coalition, um, and I've you know done that quite a lot, and then very deliberately did that within organizations. So you were giving people a tribe, you know, giving people that that team and that network. Um, and that helps when you're not alone, too. Yeah, I mean, it helps to not be alone. You started the diversity group at the Republic, right? Mia? I did, mm -hmm. and it just like lives on. It's a beautiful thing, and and it helps when it's authentic and when they actually get response when there is responsibility and there is outcome that is positive, and we were able to do that. That made a big difference, and then they scaled it across the company. So that's a really a good outcome and, too. And Julie and I have visited a lot of news organizations on this book tour and a number of them are doing that as well. They're creating those those micro groups that anybody can join, you know, except right. in one case in one news organization only women could join and I kind of thought that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it, it is and it isn't. I think there's sometimes there's space, like I, having an ERG where, you know, you do want other, you don't just want um, all the women in there, you need allies who are men. But I think they're, we're getting to the point where it's nice to have sort of that safe space too for, for yeah. women's groups. And I, I've changed my mind about that over time, the older I get. So we're, we're coming up on your time. Sorry, Deborah, you didn't get to all your questions. That's yet. fine. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having fun listening. So at the end of the book, you say you're very optimistic for your daughters. And I, I was driving down Route 87 when I was listening to that. And I was like, mm, I'm not so optimistic for my daughter. And she's almost 30. So, you know, I'm, uh, I think our daughters are around the same age and she has a great job. But what, what is it about you, your thinking about your girls that makes you feel confident? Well, I mean, for me, I just, and it's not just my daughters, or, although they fit this, is I think they're just much less willing to shut up and put up with things. Mm -hmm. And that is a really important um, change. And the Me Too movement reflects that, right? Um, that has to make a difference, I think. Um, not just for them as individuals, but for the groups of women that they work with. And, um, and so that gives me some encouragement. And then maybe also the data, like you talked about, Julia, if we could yeah, I mean, I think, show I think that it makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I think a combination of this generation not being willing to just sort of sit down and take your place. And I think increasing emphasis on data will ultimately uh, bring about change. Well, we are at the end of our time. Um, so I want to thank all of you for, for being part of this. It's very exciting to me. This is very something I'm really passionate about. And I wonder if, if each of you has one last thought that you want to share. Uh, you can buy the book on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Not to be too uh, crass about it, but. Uh, actually, Changing Hands has it too, and we want to support them. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, do, they they do curbside pickup. Yeah. And if you order it through um, Changing Hands, we'll sign it for you, I think. I don't know. Can we still go in and sign books, Julia? No. No. <laughs> Well, you can have anyway, you can, you can uh, meet my, them in the driveway, and you know. They, yeah, they, there you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I'm Joya underline D underline Wallace on Twitter, LinkedIn. Reach out, connect. Um, uh, I guess my big advice is the resiliency. If I was to offer anybody advice, I mean, we sort of touched on it a little bit, but you are going to get discouraged. You're going to have people tell you no, and you got to figure out how to dust yourself off and keep going. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I am hopeful. I don't, I don't have daughters, but I, I have a lot of female students and, and I am inspired by them and I'm inspired by the changes that are starting to happen. Um, they just, it's just going to take longer than we wanted them to. And the, the resilience piece, I mean, I think that's, and we're good at that. Like we're tough, right? As women, that, that is one of our skill sets. Like we're able to take a whole lot of literal and figurative pain and knock ourselves, you know, get knocked down and stand back up again. So, and the you only know, thing I would more add, more than you realize. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would add is don't second guess yourself to death. Um, mm-hmm. Have enough confidence to move forward. And, and this is a great sign too, that you're wanting to have this kind of conversation. So I think that that's fantastic. Well, being a woman leader, I'm a little biased, right? <laughs> <laughs> so walk down the mall and come visit me when we're allowed to do that. And absolutely. Uh, for, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time today and um, really just being so generous with your thinking and open um, to sharing your thoughts. So yeah. thank and I'm you. sorry we didn't get to all the questions. So apologize. We got people's questions. So, okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for doing it. it. Uh, Thanks for your interest. Bye. Thank you. Bye.